Major funding for these programs is provided by grants from Capital One Bank and Perfect Building Maintenance, Murray Hill Properties, SJP Properties, Cushman and Wakefield, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, New York Community Bank, Bank of America, Kilroy Metal Products, New York's Window Company. Additional funding is provided by Akron Gold Brothers, LLC, Briarwood Organization, C.B. Richard Ellis, City Investment Fund, Essex Capital Partners, Excel Realty Advisors, First American Title Insurance Company of New York, First Service Williams, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Helmsley Spear, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, James Orfanides, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Madison Realty Capital, M&T Bank, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Must Development, Palin Enterprises, Rosenthal and Rosenthal, Signature Bank, Sterling and Sterling, Stephen Napolitano, Stonehenge Partners, Studley, The Moynian Group. Hello, my name is Michael Stoller. You know, nobody knows what's happening in the real estate market. You know, there are people from New York, people from the Midwest, and around the country saying, our value is dropping, you know, where is the bottom there? Where are we? So today I've assembled two gentlemen from the Midwest and one gentleman from New York to provide their perspective on the state of the market, values, and what's happening. My guests today include Kyle Elfer, Senior Vice President at the John Buck Companies, Gideon Gill, Managing Principal at Madison Realty Capital, and last but not least, Josh Deitch, uh, Senior Managing Director at Mesereau Financial. So since the two of you came in all the way from Chicago to be with me today, how how's the investment market on the real estate world, Mr. Uh, Evers? How, how is the investing world? Yeah, it's it's um, opportunistic in, <laughs> in the truest sense. So what do you mean by that? Well, there's there's uh, continues to be the bid ask spread that that has been there for 12 months, um, and if you have the capitalization to pursue new opportunities, we think that now's the right time. You know, that's what we, we spoke prior to the show that that you have decided to, you're in contract for a property in Washington D.C. Mm -hmm. What do you think? What do you think it's a good time? When Mr. Deitch said to me before, in the last year, he hasn't really the funds that he inv invests with haven't really bought anything. Mm -hmm. Maybe a million dollars of capital. Mm -hmm. Why do you like Washington D.C.? I mean, what what's good about Washington D.C.? Yeah, our funds are, are diversified. So we have a development component, we have a, a debt component, distressed debt, uh, and an equity component. And to the extent we're placing new equity, we think the Washington D.C. market is is one market in particular that we'd be keen uh, and interested in. So you know, we, we've pursued that. Gideon, you, you know, you, you're providing debt. What markets do you like and what markets don't you like today? Well, we look around the country. Uh, I'd say we like to look wherever uh, there are conventional lenders that want to lend as well. And we also try to look at things that are not, I would say, more sector specific. So we're not looking at the high-end products at this point. We're really looking at, you know, call it Class B, Class C even. Uh, things that we think are going to be a little more recession resistant, or I should say maybe didn't have uh, rents elevate as high, so there's uh, a little less to fall in this type of marketplace. So we're, we're trying to take a very defensive posture right now, um, just based on what we're seeing fundamentals in the marketplace. Uh, and Josh, you know, you're, you're a hybrid. <clears throat> What's Mesero really? An investment advisor, or what, what, what do you see yourself as in the Mesero financial? Well, the, the, the fund that I'm responsible for is a fund of funds. And so we raise capital from investors and then invest in other real estate-related private equity funds like Kyle's fund and, and Gideon's fund. Um, 
which we haven't invested in either, just for disclosure so far, <laughs> <laughs> yet. yet. <laughs> um, but we also have a global mandate. So in addition to looking at markets in the US, <clears throat> we're looking across the, the world, really, in Asia, Europe, and Latin America as well, to provide a diversified real estate investment product for our investors. So, so when you're meeting with these funds like Gideon's and Kyle's and others, what, what, do, what are you looking for? I mean, you, you, know, you said to me, prior to the show that one of the funds that you invested with, all they invested was like a million dollars in America in the last year in the U.S. Um, what's your thoughts and what's the thought of Mesero with regard to domestic investing today? Well, I, I happen to think that on a risk-adjusted basis, the U.S. is probably the most attractive market in the world today. Um, you know, I, I do think it's going to get worse before it gets better. We haven't seen the bottom yet. Uh, there's a tremendous overhang of debt that's coming up for refinancing. I think something like a trillion and a half dollars over the next three years. Who knows how that's going to be worked out? But the reality is that this is the deepest, most liquid market in the world. There's a flight to quality to the U.S. that even though I think we're going to lose our investment grade credit rating, this is still the place to be. And to be able to buy assets today at the prices that we're starting to see, and even though financing is very difficult and relatively expensive, we're at historic wides on yield spreads between what cap rates are and interest rates. And so that's a pretty attractive investment opportunity today, especially when you're buying at substantial discounts to replacement costs. Now, you know, both of you are from the Windy City. How do you look at investments today in the Chicago market or the Illinois market? We're, we are invested in Chicago. Well, no, I'm saying, I know you're invested. I'm, I'm looking today. You know, I was in Chicago a couple of weeks ago. You know, there's a number of condominiums. There's a number of new office buildings. You're mm -hmm. building a new office building. You're building a new office building. You know, and rents in Chicago really never go up too much. You know, the, I think Willis, who's taking over the Sears Tower, is paying $18 a, a square foot for that. I mean, you know, $18, would, and it's a great location. Now, how do you look at those type of investments? How could you make a great return or yield on that? Well, Just because you're in the fee business? No. No, <laughs> <laughs> no our, our funds aren't uh, in the fee business, but, um, you know, we, we develop, you know, at the appropriate time in the cycle in Chicago, and that's what the John Buck Company has done over time, and they've been successful uh, at doing that and building a brand. And that's been successful. No, I know. I'm, I'm only joking. The John Buck Company yeah. has invested in Chicago and has a great reputation in Chicago. It's, it's cyclical, like anything else. So you have to. But, you but have, you've also you have invested to, have here. The time. I mean, yeah. uh, the John Buck Companies in the early 2000s invested on a, uh, a mixed-use property on 92nd Street, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, had a good, interesting component. You had an 80/20 apartment house, 80% mm -hmm. market rate, 20% affordable. Mm -hmm. You had a hotel component next to it, mm -hmm. and and then you had a public school component, mm -hmm. a community space, which worked out very well. Mm -hmm. And now you're involved with another investment here. We, we are. Uh, we do have a residential uh, building under construction here in Tribeca. Mm. Uh, so that's, that's underway. And well, of all the asset classes today, you know, you, because you're bullish uh, on a U.S. which so Gideon and I it's are. It's a relative. Relative, so relative. Relatively bullish. Which asset class do you like? You know, there are four in the, you know, in the food chain, okay? You know, you have multifamily, you have office, you have retail, you have industrial, and you have hotel. There are probably five in the food chain. So what do you like, what do you like most and what do you dislike the most? Well, it's it. That's kind of a loaded question, Michael, because it depends on you know what your horizon is and where you see the value is going to be. I, I guess that I would answer it in a couple of ways, and I'm, I guess I won't answer your question directly. First of all, I think that debt in general is more attractive than equity, and on a risk-adjusted basis, to be able to acquire debt at the discounts that we're starting to see them with equity dollars behind you as security to me feels like a better risk reward trade off than going into an equity deal today. Now there are exceptions. Relative to the asset classes, we're spending a lot of time right now, and, and it is really market by market. I think that as an aggregate, and if you look at NACREF as a benchmark, I think that multifamily and industrial will outperform office and retail this year. Uh, does that mean you should buy multifamily and industrial relative to office and retail? No. 
Uh, I think that New York office is a very interesting place to be over the next two to three years, where this is a tremendously deep and liquid market, uh, where there is going to be job growth eventually, and we think that you can buy significant value with huge barriers to entry. You're not going to have competition relative to new buildings, so therefore that's attractive. But one of the asset classes that we're spending a lot of time looking at right now is in hospitality. You know, the RevPAR numbers have been absolutely decimated. Values are plummeting and are going to continue to do so. But as an asset class, we think that that is the best. One of the nice things about real estate is typically it's a inflation hedge and we can have a big discussion about it but yeah, I but think the interesting thing you know I'll ask Gideon and Kyle's opinion the the the, the, the negative I've been on the board of the <clears throat> hospitality REIT the problem is hospitality is running a business no question it, it's different than regular real estate where it's a different time each day the register leaves I have to put a new customer in mm -hmm. I mean Everybody thought that uh, you know David Lichtenstein was the brightest guy in the world when he bought Extended Stay with such leverage. Um, the the recent study by Smith Travel is that the Extended Stay business has been hurt more than anyone else last year. Mm -hmm. I mean, as you stated, and it's a fact that during the first four months of this year, revenue per room is down about forty percent. Mm -hmm. Occupancy is down about 30 percent, and you know if you just take this into serious situation, it's a very difficult time. It's a tough market. I mean, what's your thought about the hospitality market? Well, the, the ho I was going to go back to an earlier comment as far as like where you know your original question about sector, and part of it is is timing and time frame as far as how long your investment horizon is. You know, we're primarily debt, so we kind of take a snapshot of, of of now and the concept of being repaid. So on the debt side, it's pretty easy for us to say multifamily because when you really look up the food channel, it's you know Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, local savings banks, the, you know essentially the agencies that are still lending, and you know the government essentially still lending. That's that's really what's working right now in that space. If if you want to take a longer term horizon, as far as you know whether it's New York office or you kind of pool you know more I don't know if I call it contrarian plays, but longer term retail office if you get in at the right entry point. Um, you might struggle with it for a little while, but historically you will eventually have a bounce and, and you potentially could do better over a longer time horizon because of the comeback, let's say, whether it's New York City office or grocery anchored retail or whatnot. So um, we're not big hotel lenders, but we agree with you that it almost has to be at, at call like a, a no-brainer number right now for us to go into it. Like you really have to look at cash flow that's you know not historical. You really have to get very comfortable that if you had to um, undercut the whole market, what, what rate would that make you comfortable with and, and make mm -hmm. that happen? So it, it's, I think that's a much tougher proposition. But I, I think that's exactly the point, though. I mean, if you're looking at, if, if, if intuitively we know that all this real estate debt is in trouble, but the owners are still making their payments because they've got tenants that are paying rent, then we're just kind of kicking the can down the road. In the hospitality market, that's not happening. You know, the, the rooms are not there, and there's no income coming in, and these owners are in real trouble, and that's where we're starting to see the significant distress. You know, it's interesting. I was reading uh, one of the real estate publications thing, and they said that certain properties were sent to the special servicer, and one of them was in New York City called the Dream Hotel. Mm -hmm. So they had $100 million of debt. There's no way that certain of these hotels could pay off their debt uh, no. today. No. I mean, well, the hotel has the most, like, current mark to market out of any of the property types. I mean, you literally, like you said, on a daily basis, you are readjusting almost, I'm not going to say like the stock market, but, right. you know, multifamily generally marks every year and office could be every five to 10 years. So, you know, you're really getting true marks on a daily basis. And that, that's, that's what's the most challenging part about that business mm -hmm. right now. Kyle? Yeah, we're, we're, not, we're really not touching, you know, industrial or, or multifam, or excuse me, in, uh, uh, hospitality. We're focused on office and, and multifamily. But, but you know, what about uh, you know uh, Josh's comment with regard to retail? I mean, and, yeah. and I think you know if you can buy retail at the right price. Now, a very interesting. I, I read this article, which I'm going to write an article about it recently. You know, they were talking about with this recession, um, a large portion of the employees who earn a living is teenagers. They, they they control you know they have a mm -hmm. large amount of the disposable income teenagers spend money, and there's going to be a higher unemployment there is a higher unemployment number for teenagers because adults are trying to get the job, and it's stated that places like Abercrombie and Finch, um, 
and Aeropostale are doing terrible. Abercrombie was down 60% in revenue mm -hmm. because of the disposable income. So, you know, it's an interesting dilemma. You know, people say, what's the right thing? You know, is it circuit? Look what happened with Circuit City. You know, there are certain people, and but, but I read the other day that the Circuit City name is now was sold. And the company mm -hmm. who bought the, the CompUSA name is using this. You know, so the, right. you know, it's a crazy thing. Have you ever done retail, or has that been? We, we'll do urban mixed use. But not standalone big box or community center retail. Would and you? I mean, with, in, in your fund to fund investments, would you make a, uh, an investment with somebody who's in the retail? Yeah, of? absolutely. And and you know, it, again, in 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 this country, and then there are sub markets within the retail sector. I mean, I think that grocery anchored retail is probably the most attractive on a risk adjusted basis. Today, people still have to buy food, et cetera, et cetera. But where retail, I think, is more compelling, and again, my time horizon, we have a 10-year fund, and we're looking into the future, and we're looking at um, pretty significant growth markets is in the emerging markets. You know, in China or in Brazil, for example, I mean, there were there were there there are more retail shopping centers in Simon Properties than there are in the country of Brazil. And you know, there, that's a maybe pretty that's an opportunity. Right. What you're suggesting. Yeah. So right. I mean, I mean, I you know, there, there, this is a growing country with growing per capita GDP, very rich in natural resources, and uh, you know, I think retail there is pretty interesting. Now, couch that in the last couple of years, retail development in Mexico has been a really hot sector, and now they're getting hammered. Now. I, I think that's because the Mexican economy is far more correlated to the U.S. economy than uh, than so in Brazil. Sitting in my former em employers, we made a major commitment to Mexico at the wrong time. You know, five shopping centers. You know, it was just a, a difficult time. You know, everybody thought another new Walmart would do well in, in Mexico right. in, in this situation. But you know, w when you're looking, and I and I, I think it's an interesting point that you bring out the ten-year horizon. If you're looking in the 10-year horizon today, what's the type of debt? You're, I think you're saying to me that you want debt that can be repaid. You're not looking own to own, loan to own. So what do you, what, what do you feel is the, the best product and the most dangerous product in the, in the horizon? As far as term of loan? or yeah. well, Term and also the type of product. Well, you know, to, to the retail point and to a lot of what's about real estate right now, you, you know, we, we try to track what's the underlying impetus of, of what's going on in commercial real estate. So, like, if we take retail, you know, you see, you read right now that consumers are saving more than they've saved in, in, I don't know, at least a decade at this point as far as the savings rate. And that's impacting retail, and people are really trying to scrape by necessity. So we really do look as far as, you know, grocery anchor, drugstore anchor type retail as being more interesting. You know, and we're really trying to take an approach of, uh, we almost think shorter term is better at this point. If you can lock in longer term financing as an owner, that's yeah. a phenomenal proposition. But as someone who is a lender, we're not trying to go too far out on the horizon curve because we think there's so much uh, dislocation and transition in the marketplace right now that a lot of people are going to come really for these value add propositions or patch type deals and that the ultimate stabilization really remains to be seen. So. It's it's like what's really going through the entire market right now. It's, it's everything is very transitional. I think it's, it's an interesting question, you know, t relative to duration. And, and Kyle brought it up about this bid bid ask spread. And I think that a lot of it comes from the kind of relative value of time. As a buyer, time is your friend. You know, the, you have all the leverage with fresh capital today, and you don't have mm -hmm. to rush into any deal. And as an owner, time is your enemy. You've got this clock ticking on this refinance on your loan, no matter what, is significantly more dangerous than it was, you know, a year and a half ago. And so, you know, relative to that, cash is king. And so if you're a buyer, if time is your enemy, then it, as you own something, you want income. I, I think this is exactly what you did, what you're doing in Washington right now. Yeah, listen, a year ago, you had to put down 10% of your money hard, you could maybe tour the property. <laughs> <laughs> and today? And today, there, it's legitimate due diligence. You have 30 plus days, 45 days to close. You have full due diligence access to but you property know, records. You know, you said you were a lender this year. I mean, you've been lending money. You lent money up in Boston, right? We've also been in the distressed debt space. Yeah, we've, we've Explain purchased. Explain to my audience what do you mean by that? We, we've, we've bought into, into two mezzanine loans that were uh, suspect to be repaid. You were repaid on one? We were repaid, correct. We were in the right position. 
And the other one? Uh, we still own it. But yeah. what kind of loan is it? Uh, it's a mezzanine loan that we got a significant discount up front that will Office, hold. residential. It's, it's actually a mixed, mixed use. It's the John Hancock Tower. We like Hancock. Uh, so it's the John Hancock Tower in Chicago. What do you want? You bought the one in Boston? The <laughs> is it easy to write John Hancock Boston? It, John Han it, must, yeah. it must be. Yeah, right. Those were too, too attractive you know, last year. Now, who owns the John Hancock Tower now? It's a Whitehall fund with a local operator, Gallup. Yeah. So it has an office component, a parking garage, broadcast towers, an observatory deck, and retail. So it's really a, a mixed use project but you, and it's it's operating you know status quo and there's some term left on the debt and but we, we entered into those distressed debt investments really on a on an indifference point as as an operator we have the capability to take over the property so we we buy in at a position where we're right, happy as a lender no, no, because, or, because you're also that's your home market you know how to operate this is your business you own operate and develop mm -hmm. so this is something that if you had to take it over you wouldn't mind taking it over that's exactly right. You know, yeah, as opposed right. to someone else. I mean, Gideon's company would take over if they have to, but that's not their prime business over there. That's right. But yeah, I, so I think that that's a critical point for, let's say, equity guys who are going to the, the debt side. You really have mm -hmm. to have the operations in place in order to want to, because I think, to own, because I think that's a very real uh, outcome in a lot of these situations in debt, especially in, you know, higher up in the capital structure with mezzanine debt. So, you know, it makes sense. It's sort of an option for you guys that you could potentially get the the property at some point. Um, but yeah, not everybody can do that, or there shouldn't be doing that. At least. No, right. no. And there's there's a whole host of additional risks beyond real estate. There's the legal risk and how you know how the the all the players uh, in the right. structured and, finance and I think that's something behave that, together. I think you have to realize that that. The, those legal risks, you don't know what goes through the legal. You know, the legal environment is strange in different states and different uh, It's real. It's, it's real, it's, and it has to be accounted for up front, yeah, to the best you can underwrite it. So, so which markets, if you were investing in the U.S., we're not going to talk about uh, South America, China, or anything else, which markets would you invest your company today? We'll invest in Chicago because it's our, our local expertise, and we why know do, it. Why do you invest in New York? I mean, you... we're lo we're looking in New York, and and we're active in Washington D.C. Uh, what about uh, would you think of the Los Angeles market? We would look there, but it's a secondary market for us. Um, so we're a little more conservative, you know, in the in, the, in those markets. Gideon. We, we have historically done most of our investing in the Northeast. So let's say from Boston to D.C. Um, but we cast a wider net, so we really are looking around the country. Um, there are definitely markets that we we avoid. We really are doing nothing and will do nothing in, let's say, Las Vegas and Phoenix and those types of markets. But, you know, interestingly, the South Florida market, which has been you know, absolutely hammered, is is starting to become interesting as far as, uh, you know, some of the point you made about the bid-ask spread. Mm -hmm. It's really narrowing down there, and I don't know if that means it's in a further stage of healing compared to some of the other markets, but there are definitely some interesting opportunities, um, condo deals that just clearly are not going to be condos, but could be residential plays, rentals, and um, at some entry points it does, it is starting to make sense. Josh, if you're meeting with funds, you know, to invest with, which markets would you feel comfortable and which ones wouldn't you feel comfortable? We were really focused on job growth and, and, and you know, future growth opportunities combined with kind of the level of distress. And we're really focused on the coasts. We like Seattle, we like San Francisco, we like New York, Boston. But I think that, you know, D.C. is one of the more attractive markets in the country today. I think we're going to see some pretty significant job growth. With uh, King Obama, there's going to be some serious growth going on. There's no question with Obama <clears throat> land, it's Washington D.C. is going to be a very good market now. But you well, bring, there's there's another factor here. This is liquidity, and and sure. those markets we're talking about yeah. are the most liquid, Absolutely. even even today, and that matters. Yeah. Because you don't know what the future bring, you know, will bring. But you know. But if you're you know, in a liquid market, you feel. But, but, but would you, know, you buy an office building in Detroit for, at a 15 cap? I wouldn't buy an office building in Detroit at any price. Well, that's that's the, <laughs> that's the point. I, I, I mean, but there was a very interesting article. I, I'm not sure if it was in the today's New York Times, where they talk about two cities in Michigan, like one is Ann Arbor right. and one Warren. is Warren. Right, right. right. And, 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 yeah. you know, and, and it shows, you know, Ann Arbor has the, I mean, 
Wolverines uh, go over blue. there, go blue. You know, it <laughs> has it has the university, it has industry, it has, and then you, then you really have the rest of Michigan, which is dead. I mean, it, it's not the market. You know, the, is there anything decent in Michigan? Yeah, look, I'm from Detroit, so you know, and 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 uh, I'm I'm not, I'm not a what investor. What a I'm not setup. Really what a from setup. Detroit. You're from Southfield. I mean, yeah, you know, blooming. I mean, come on, you know, let's let's understand. Don't count Michigan out. That and I, you know, Michigan's under the whole state's under a lot of pressure right now, and and they had a lot of problems because of their dependence on the auto industry. Uh, I happen to think that those markets will come back, and I I think actually that with electric cars that they could start booming again. But who knows about timing? And you know, as as a as a person who's responsible for investing in with risk-adjusted returns, I agree with you. I don't know if there's there there has to be some pretty compelling you, you, numbers. You know, uh, there's always the right price. Sure. For uh, for an asset, but it also depends on how long your timeline is. Right. And I think you bring it out. I mean, I'm not selling. Michigan down. Eventually, you know, the GM will work out, the Chrysler will work out, there'll be a different market. Right. But I think it's also, you know, you have to evaluate where where do you want to put your money? Mm -hmm. I mean, you have a fiduciary responsibility. You have All three of you have a fiduciary responsibility. And if somebody said to you, why are you making this decision today over here, you better have a good rationale. And to uh, Kyle's point, I mean, if you're investing in markets where there's not liquidity, you're making a big bet. You better be right. If you're in markets where it's liquid, there are ways of, you know, you can exit if you see kind of the signs on the wall that you made the wrong decision and maybe mitigate some of those potential losses. And that's why we think that those markets will rebound fastest, and, and that's why we're focused on those markets. And, and with your comment, I'm happy to say that there is going to be a rebound. We're not sure. Absolutely. And I'd like to thank my two friends who came in from the Midwest and Gideon uh, Gill for being here. I'd like to thank Kyle Effers, Gideon Gill, and Josh Day. See you next week. Major funding for these programs is provided by grants from Capital One Bank and Perfect Building Maintenance, Murray Hill Properties, SJP Properties, Cushman and Wakefield, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, New York Community Bank, Bank of America, Kilroy Metal Products, New York's Window Company. Additional funding is provided by Akron Gold Brothers, LLC, Briarwood Organization, C.B. Richard Ellis, City Investment Fund, Essex Capital Partners, Excel Realty Advisors, First American Title Insurance Company of New York, First Service Williams, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Helmsley Spear, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, James Orfanides, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Madison Realty Capital, M&T Bank, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Must Development, Palin Enterprises, Rosenthal and Rosenthal, Signature Bank, Sterling and Sterling, Stephen Napolitano, Stonehenge Partners, Studley, The Moining Group.